morning, Oceanside Church. Hope you are doing well. A couple of quick announcements before we begin. I uh, want to mention that we have a high school youth Vespers coming up. It's going to be on October 9, Friday at 7 p.m. at the church grounds. So I just tell your high school kid, uh, if they're freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, to come through. Uh, it's going to be a fun night with with songs, with a little bit of a devotional about hope and from one of our own, really. And then um, some s'mores and hot dogs. No, don't worry, we'll have masks and social distancing, so please, please come through. On October 17, we are having a young adult hike. So for collegiates and above, uh, we are going to meet at the church parking lot right after church. And then uh, we're going to take off, have some lunch, go do some hikes, and then grab something to eat and come back. So it's going to be a day trip to Anza Borrego. Hopefully it won't be too too warm. But uh, I think the weather will cool up uh, by then. So cool down, I mean, by then. So it'll be really good for you all to join us as well. So if you have any questions about it, hit me up. Uh, Pastor Kevin, 240-476-3426. I don't know if you know that number, but now you do. <laughs> um, yeah, we're praying for a lot of people right now. We're praying for a lot of, lot of, lot of concerns, just a lot of things going on in our church family. So, you know, we're asking people to pray. 12 o'clock every day, we are um, inviting you to, wherever you are, uh, to just pause for a bit and seek the Lord in prayer. Pray for our country, pray for silent requests in our community. Um, just and and just take that time to just pause because it's so easy to just get caught up in the in the next and the next and the next thing. So let's let's seek the Lord in prayer and with that in mind, uh, let's uh, let's worship and tune our hearts, tune our minds to God's voice so that we can uh, we can hear a voice uh, and word from Him today.
sing hallelujah, Christ is risen, bow down before him, for he is Lord of all, sing hallelujah, Christ is The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought Let's pray. Dear most loving Father, God, thank you for this time where we can get to talk to you. We come before you, Lord, um, because you are powerful, you are sovereign, and you care about us, you love us. And so, Lord, I come to you, Lord, we come to you at this point with, with a hearts full of gratitude, with hearts full of praise, but also burdened hearts, Lord want to lift up some people into your midst, Lord. We want to continue to pray for the Taupao family, the Cochrane family, um, Natalie and the Wilkening family, the Longoria family, the um, Jet, Lord, thank you so much for healing him. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you would continue to be with uh, Jonathan Chung, that you would heal him and restore him. Helia, Lord, please be with her as well. Um, the Golia family, Lord, keep them close to you and draw close to them, Lord. Um, we pray for the medical professionals who are in the front lines, that you lead them and guide them and protect them, Lord. Uh, we pray for uh, this country. I also want to pray for uh, the President, the First Lady, for COVID-19. Pray that you please heal them as well. And also to just the countless people who are suffering through COVID-19, Lord. Um, it's, just, it's, just, it's just a lot. So I pray that you please, Lord, be with them. Be with these families. You know what's going on, Lord. Yeah, we know that you didn't cause any of this. But I know that you are working uh, through and amongst all these people. Lord. Heal them, please, Lord Jesus. Um, God, we want to continue to pray for this, uh, this country. The, with the civil unrest and all the things that's going on leading up to the election, I pray that you would give people wisdom, understanding, help us to show Christ-like love and compassion even in the midst of differences, Lord. And I pray that you would uh, inspire us to be models of what love should be like because that's what the church is supposed to be anyway. Thank you for all that you've done. You know our requests, you know the things that we are thinking about and praying about, and I pray, Lord, that you tune our hearts Tune our minds to the frequency of your voice. Thank you so much for all that you've done for us. And through your grace, the things that you will do through us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, everyone. Our backyard camp out this weekend 
if you want to come, send me an email and I'll have a s'mores kit for you. You can see the times on the slides, pick them up. If you haven't picked up one yet, come by anyway. I'll probably have one for you. I'll see you then and I hope you join us to Friday, Saturday night, 6.30. And if you want the Zoom passcode, you've got to email me, OceansideAdventistKids at gmail.com. See you then. Bye. Good morning, everyone. Put your hands up high, open, shut them. Open, shut them. Give a little clap. Open, shut them. Open, shut them. Fold them in your lap. Have you ever heard of the word zoopharmacognosy? It's a big word, isn't it? It means animal and medicine and how they go together. Maybe when you're sick, mama gives you some medicine or daddy gives you medicine, or maybe you go to bed and take a nap. Maybe you drink lots of cold water. But what does an animal do when it doesn't feel well, when it gets a tummy ache? What does it do and how does it know what to do it? Well, there are people that study this and that's the study of zoopharmacognosy. So and scientists have discovered a few things. Animals do seem to know how to self-medicate or take care of themselves. Birds don't want to have bugs in their feathers, like parasites. So they will take millipedes or ants in their beak and rub the animal, the insect, over their feathers. Isn't that funny? But the ant and the millipede give off a certain chemical and it kills all the bugs and insects so they won't be living on the bird. Now they've studied elephants too. Mama elephants eat regular food, elephant food, when they're pregnant. They eat the leaves, anything else they normally eat. But when they're about ready to give birth, they will go eat from a special tree. One elephant walks 17 miles to get to the place where the trees grow. And then she started eating the leaves. And then she walked back to her home. And a day or two later, she had her baby. Now scientists wondered, why did she do that? What's in that tree? So they looked at the tree leaves. They went to the laboratory and they studied them and found out that they induce birth. And then talked to the Kenyan women and they too drink that tea right before birth. The elephant knew that. Now bonobos and chimpanzees sometimes get tummy aches, sometimes get parasites in their tummy or in their intestines. And when that happens, they know to eat from a certain plant. The plant has a pretty yellow flower as you can see in the picture and they take those leaves which are really prickly and they pick them and pile them in a pile on top of their tongue. They do not chew them. The plant tastes terrible. They roll it up into a ball and then swallow the leaves whole. Why would they do that? Do you ever small, swallow a pill? Well, that's like a pill for them. They swallow it whole and scientists think that it cleans out their intestine, it cleans out their gut to make them have clean intestines and no parasites. That's pretty smart, isn't it? Other animals do the same thing. Colobus monkeys will go to where you've had a fire and they pick up the charcoal and eat it because it makes their tummy feel better. People sometimes use charcoal for that too. And parrots in South America will climb up on a muddy bank from the river, climb up into the mud and where there's clay soil, they'll eat the soil because again, it cleans their intestines. And when your intestines are clean, you feel pretty good. Did you know that Jesus gives you food to do that too? When Jesus was alive, there wasn't medicine as we think about it now where you go to the drugstore and buy the medicine, but there are all kinds of things he gave us for medicine, pomegranates and berries and cabbage. Remember when he was given frankincense and myrrh at his birth? Those were things you could use for healing. Myrrh lowered fevers, frankincense fought infections, garlic fights infections, berries make you stronger and fight infections, cabbage will take away swelling, pomegranates and antioxidant, all those are from Jesus. The animals know what to do when they're sick and Jesus 
gave us food to use to make us grow strong and healthy. Make me so thankful for the wonderful foods God gave us. Look at the beautiful colors of them. When you go home and have lunch, remember to tell Jesus, thank you for such wonderful food. Have a great week and I'll see you next week. Bye. If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me or scroll with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and the last two verses of uh, that chapter. So I'm reading in the NLT, so feel free to follow along in the translation of your choice. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. But now faith, hope, and love remain. Lord, I pray that you would tune our hearts, tune our minds to the frequency of your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. August 2009, humid Michigan summer, and for the first time, I stepped into the campus of Andrews University as a freshman. But as I looked around, I I thought I missed something. The place was buzzing with U-Haul trucks and caravans loaded with furniture and household appliances for their freshman daughter or their son, and there I was, with the only things that I owned. A snapback hat, a backpack, and two suitcases. (laughs) But I was grateful for my friend uh, Sharmila Shala, the only freshman I knew at the time. You see, Shala was a friend from my youth group in Maryland, and I was able to hitch a ride with her and her family when I found out a couple of weeks before that she was also going to Andrews. And as I was standing there in line, I, I did not know what to expect. You see, just over eight months prior, I moved from Oman to to Maryland with the same two suitcases and the snapback and the backpack. And now I had moved from Maryland to, to Michigan, about to start yet another phase. I moved from a space of certainty to a space of uncertainty. I moved from a space of comfort to a space of discomfort. I moved from a space of clarity to a place of confusion. This, this space, okay, the in-between space is what uh, developmental psychologists called a liminal space, a liminal space. It's this in-between space between one safe zone to the next. One author calls it the confusing in-between and you and I might call it uh, being in limbo. You've heard that phrase before. This, this liminal uh, f- space is the crossing over phase in our journeys. It's a space where you have left something behind, yet you are not f- yet fully in something else. In other words, you are in transition. For me, the liminal space looked like leaving Maryland and stepping into the campus of Andrews University. It also looked like leaving Andrews seven years later, getting married in three different ceremonies to the same woman, praise the Lord, uh, and then stepping into Oceanside Church three and a half years ago. But that in-between space can look uh, different to different groups of people. For you, that might be looking like, uh, that, that space might be like uh, the space between graduating high school and entering into college. For you, it might look like going from a space where school uh, looked just regular with people, there was no social distancing and no mask, to now an online situation where you're not even interacting with real people in the real world, just virtually. It might be the space for some of you between being laid off from work and starting a new job. And for some of us, it might be the space uh, between losing a loved one and starting a new phase in our journey. We go through these phases, church, and multiple times during our life. You know, it's, it's human to go through these, these liminal spaces. But, but rarely, okay, rarely do these, uh, does this happen to everybody 
at the same time. I don't know if you'd agree with me, but this pandemic in many ways has created this universal liminal space globally and for all of us. And if you're kind of if you about what I just said, I dare you, I just dare you to look at your 2020 calendar and the plans that you had made in 2019. Uh, who would have thought that overnight vacations would be canceled, that overnight jobs would be laid off, overnight you would, you'd realize that you would not be able to see your loved ones for a while? Who would have thought that, that that toilet paper would become a kind of sort of a form of currency, like a trading and bargaining chip? <laughs> and, and who would have thought that uh, masks will, will eventually become a form of fashion? Here's the thing, right? Here's the thing. No matter what you believe, no matter who you are, no matter what your age is, we are all in this space right now, right? And if you, th and if you would but just take a moment to, th to think about the, the disruptions that have happened in your life just in the last few months, not even last few months, just in the last few weeks, you would be, I, I suspect you'd be thinking for a very, very long time. So many changes, so many disruptions. So if you Google the phrase uh, liminal space, you will come across a lot of advice because you know this is a phrase that's used by psychologists and so they obviously uh, know to recommend some prescriptions and, 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 and uh, there's a lot of advice. There's a lot of advice from secular psychologists, from, uh, from different people as to how we can do, uh, what, what we can do to better adjust and live in this space. But what do we do? You and I, as disciples of Jesus here in Oceanside Church and from wherever you're watching right now, if you identify yourself as a disciple of Jesus, how can you and I, how can we live through this liminal space? And while there is, seems to be a lot of overlap between science and scripture regarding the liminal space, for the next few moments, I want to highlight a few unique perspectives from, from the gospel. But before we do that, though, uh, let's talk about how being in this global liminal space has affected us. And if, and, and if you look at our lives and we look at people's lives, you can come up with so many different ways in which this being in this space has affected us. But for the sake of time, I want to just highlight three, okay? Just three. The first effect that we have felt during this pandemic is that we feel powerless, right? We feel powerless. In a span of days or weeks, we went from having control over our futures and our priorities to having little control or no control at all. Planning for the future has kind of become this funny exercise, right? Like you, you plan for the, for the future and like whenever I do it, like I, I just kind of sli silently giggle or laugh at, uh, laugh at the back of my mind because I'm like, okay, I don't know if, if this is going to change in the next couple of weeks or months. Uh, but here's the thing though. The, the only constant has been, has been change. And with every uh, change, it challenges our, our feelings of being in control. But watch this, because we feel powerless, we tend to grasp for control to feel like we still have some, some power. So you feel powerless, but we want, we want to feel control, so we want to just grasp for control. And when we want to remain in control, for the most part, we, we will do anything to control someone or a group of people. For example, when some of our friends have a different political or theological imagination than us, we can easily resort to blaming and name calling in an effort to, to have control over our side of the narrative. Now, of course, there's a place for, for honest feedback, for critical thinking, for legitimate dissent. But when people, especially Christians, act out in a way to, in an effort to hoard power and hoard control, we will hurt our mission by weaponizing our witness. In other words, we will turn the gospel into, into a grenade where we can just take it and just launch it onto that person that we hate, that person with a different imagination than you. To feel a sense of control, we might watch this, we might try to either downplay reality on the one hand, we can say, you know what, everything is gonna be fine, this is okay, everything, no, no COVID, this, just, let's just kinda hang out, let's just do our thing. On the one hand, we can downplay reality, 
or on the other extreme we can exaggerate spirituality we can say oh you know what don't worry about anything jesus is coming so just let's focus on that let's just focus on that the jesus is coming all this other stuff eh whatever forget about all that stuff you see two extremes and and if you're not careful if we 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 can now start to endanger the people that god has entrusted us to love and what people are those not just christians not just people who think like us and act like us it's everybody because everybody is made and created in the image of god period so in a liminal space we can feel powerless but we can also feel uncertain right we can also feel uncertain and what happens when we can't predict the future we will end up creating what an author calls uh story weapons story weapons these are basically theories or ideas which have bits of truth that benefit the creators of these stories at the expense of the believers of these stories it preys on people's fears and eats on them and so that's how these things spread like wildfire and the perpetuation and the spread of these stories depend on how how uh weak people or people who are just like who, who just want to believe in something want to take control of the narrative they just suck suck into that and then and that's kind of how these things spread and one way and then you you have conspiracy theories and there's different types of things that that's going on right now which this author calls um story weapons story weapons in an effort to just hold on to certainty we grasp for certainty but in an effort to watch this in an effort to be right some of us can forget to be righteous we ended up we instead end up being rightish showing the veneer or the or the facade of righteousness but deep inside we know that we want to protect our own self interests and our own story and we will do nothing we will do everything to to control this narrative and that's happening right now just in a lot of in a lot of ways So we feel powerless, we feel uncertain, but on also in this liminal space we we can also feel vulnerable. Vulnerable. We might feel exposed. And here's why. Is it ironic? I mean, I'm just wondering that this pandemic while causing us to wear masks, right? Has also been this unmasking of our lives and the unmasking of our relationships and the unmasking of our power structures. and the more that we are in this in between space the more we are confronted by who we really are the more we are confronted by the reality of the systems that we have uh that we that we have been a part of for such a long time and 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 it's it kind of feels like we've been exposed and it kind of feels like everybody's like peop like we we are now beginning to see the things that we have kind of shoved down right Some of you might uh, so, some of your parents for example might have prayed at some point before covid no god i want to spend more time with my family i want to spend more time with my kids and now god's like well <laughs> you have time <laughs> you have all this time and so with the abrupt shift to spending more time with the family the the distance between work and life being blurred and families now and kids they're all in the same space doing virtual stuff uh we are we have to now our ways of coping with stress and our fatigue have been challenged i feel like for example i feel like elena and i have grown like a million times since january 2020 compared to the last 2 2 uh, and a half years uh of my life or of our marriage it's crazy you know cuz cuz because we are in the same house and and for such a long period of time which is great we are we are now asking different questions and we are uh being sensitive to different things about each other's lives and and we have to confront those realities and it's just this beautiful beautiful adventure this pandemic has been kind of the soul scan right it scanned our priorities it scanned our intentions it's scanning right now our desires what we really really want and the more that we feel scanned and the more more we feel vulnerable the more we feel exposed and and the more we may grasp for things and tools that make us feel perfect that make us feel like we've got this whole thing together at least to project the that idea of perfection to to the to other people and here at this point i don't need to bring out any stats or research to prove that that our social media use has skyrocketed right now like uh, ever since covid hit 
And so right now, more than ever, it's so easy to to create a false sense of self on, on social media platforms. And, and, and a self sense of self that is unlike our real selves. It's the self that we want other people to see in an effort to show that we've, we've got it all together. It's a survival mechanism. It's a coping mechanism. Now, this is not to suggest that we need to now boycott all social media or our communication tools that, that help us, right? But to simply show that if we are not being careful, if we're not being aware and mindful, being in this in-between liminal space can cause us to live double lives even at a non-conscious or subconscious level. So what do we do? Feeling powerless, feeling uncertain, feeling vulnerable. What do we do? What do we do as Adventists, as Christians, as people who are supposedly following the way of Jesus? Let's go back to the text that we introduced earlier. 1 Corinthians 13. Paul writes a letter to a church in crisis. And he says this, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know fully, even as I have been fully known. Now let's unpack this a little bit. Paul is saying to the church and also to us, Today, now our perception of reality is dim due to the brokenness caused by sin. But then, then we shall see reality in the way God sees reality. What's this then he's talking about? He's clearly talking about the the, the coming kingdom, the coming of, of Jesus, the anticipation of the new earth. He says, now our vision of ourselves right now is is incomplete. We see ourselves in the mirror and it's dim and it's dark, it's incomplete. But then we will see ourselves as God sees us. Now the default setting is to see our lives through the lens of our own desires. But then we will see it through the lens of God's love. So according to Paul, what kind of space is this? You have a now space and you have a then space and you have an in-between space. It's, it's talk, he's talking about a liminal space right now. He's talking about a liminal space, a space between where we are and where we are going to be. But he doesn't end there. He talks about three things that remain as constant in a constantly changing situation. What are they? Three things. Faith. Hope. And love. Faith, hope, and love. And I want you to kind of stay here with me, okay? Because we're going to come full circle. This is so cool. Watch. Remember the first effect of, of being in a liminal space? What was it? Being what? Powerless. Being powerless. Now, which can lead to the grasping of control. Because you, you want to feel more power. You want to have more control. What if maybe an antidote to that is faith. To have faith in the Christian imagination means to trust that there's more to reality than what meets the eye. That there's more to reality than what we know through our feelings and our emotions and our experience. President Eisenhower uh, said, said this after World War II. In preparing for battle, he said, I have always found that plans are useless. But planning is indispensable. Plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. So maybe to have faith in this in-between liminal pandemic space is to do everything to plan and to prepare for the future. But once you have planned, to place now those plans and your priorities in a higher story than your own. To have faith is to maybe choose not to control people or not to control your narrative or being addicted or to release that addiction that you have or surrender that addiction that you have to certainty and control. Why? Because there is one who is. Somehow. The second effect of being in the liminal space is feeling uncertain, which can lead to a grasping or craving for certainty. But maybe an antidote to that is hope. Is hope. Even secular scientists, my friends, are are recommending to to have a hopeful mindset about the future. These are people who necessarily don't have a theistic worldview or a framework. And they're even saying, yo, you need to have 
a hopeful mindset when you're in these spaces. Now, how much more, how much more should those of us who have a theistic framework or a gospel-oriented worldview practice hope? Not, note that I said, I, I said uh, practice, okay? Practice hope because hoping is a choice. It's always a choice. It's a deliberate practice of, of being. And when you choose to conduct your life with a mindset of hope, grounded in a system of truth, you won't be over time threatened by uncertainty. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, uncertainty can over time become this, this beautiful space, a space where new knowledge is, is poured into you, your hearts. But as long as we hold on to our ideas of what truth is, as long as we hold on to our ideas uh, of, of what uh, religion is or what, 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 what our political views are, like if you just hold on to that, watch this, ideas can eventually become our idols. And then we start to worship them, thinking that we're actually worshiping God. So, so maybe uh, having a hopeful mindset is to also be open to the fact that there is stuff that, that you have no idea, but it opens up your capacities to, to, to actually digest new information that God will give you, either through the word, through, the, through nature, or through other people especially through other people who you might have dismissed off as, oh, you know, it's those guys. Or it's those, those people. There's nothing that they can teach me. That's not how it works. You see, when the world shouts, give up, hope whispers, get up. When the world shouts, you are done. It is finished. Hope whispers, not yet. One more time. Let's go. Hope, hope. It's in our, it's in our, it's in our uh, identity. Adventists, <laughs> people who are literally hoping or waiting in expectant hope for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Faith helps to to resist um, the sense of powerlessness. Hope helps to resist, at some level, the feelings of uncertainty. And what is the last one? Love, love. Check this out, this is cool. When we feel vulnerable in the transition phase, in the liminal phase, love helps us to resist our grasping for perfection. Resist our grasping for perfection. In another place in scripture, it says that perfect love casts out all fear, all of it. That fear also includes, my friends, the fear of opinion or the fear of perception. When we know, please listen, when we know that we are loved, that, when, that, that we are designed and created, beautifully created, intentionally created in the image of God, that means to, to be created with the capacity to love and a capacity for love. And, and, that, and when we know deep inside that God looks at us with now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, that God not only loves us, but God also likes us, likes us, then we can be now free from the prisons that we have created, the prisons of other people's perspectives, of how our life should be. You begin to live and thrive not to now get love, but because you are loved. You are released from the burden and the pressure of managing your image because here nobody knows the stuff and the things that you have gone through like Jesus does, like God does. So so you're released from the burden of like, I need to create this perfect image of ourselves. And if you know you're a child of God, if you know that that you are God's beloved son or daughter, that will show up in your life as as fruits of the Holy Spirit. And what are those? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Here's a, a quick fruit inspection check, if you will. And this probably, this is just for me, or maybe just for me, to be honest with you. But maybe it's for somebody else too. Just go through your Facebook posts, your comments, 
the things that you have shared on social media on instagram snapchat the memes that you have shared whatever it is just go through all of that do an audit for the last 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 week just go through that then compare the quality of your posts with the reality of the fruit how did you do <laughs> i know i'm not doing great i know but i'm also relieved watch this i'm also relieved that my responsibility church is not to grow the fruit but to actually carry the fruit or to bear the fruit and that on this side of eternity i will be powerless to to practice faith and hope and love because we see dimly right now in this liminal liminal space all i can do and all you can do my friend is to plan for the future perform to the best of your abilities uh, function with the best resources and the knowledge and the information that you have right now but continue to place our future our present and our past in the hands of jesus and to surrender the outcomes to him hard hard super hard thing to do and that's why things like faith and hope and love especially right now are fighting positions these are revolutionary postures in an environment in an age that's allergic to anything that's transcendent in a in a in, in a image man- management uh ecosystem where we are always sensitized to like what other people think about us and and what are this person saying and that person saying like it's too much and so god is saying listen to a church in crisis yo you got to you got to hold on to faith you got to hold on to hope you got to hold on to love i know it's the hard hardest thing to do and it's impossible for you to do on your on your strength and faith but listen i am with you i've done this thing i'm willing to help you go with you every step of the way ta i want to end let's end here i want to end um with a lesson from the life of a monarch butterfly okay monarch butterfly and uh, what's their life cycle i'm going to I'm going to ask you to remember some of the things that you talked about or oh, you remember from uh, high school okay the life cycle of a monarch butterfly what happens they go from an egg right to a larva and then to a pre-pupa stage and then to a pupa stage where it forms a cocoon then it becomes a completely different animal it's crazy right what's the qu- quiz what's the word that used for this anybody know anybody starts with m some of you got it metamorphosis i think i'm butchering the pronunciation i don't know okay meta, meta, metamorphosis meta, yeah that's that's the one so i asked uncle google i said uncle google how long does it take for the caterpillar to go from the cocoon stage to becoming a butterfly how long does it take and uncle google said depending on the butterfly it will take anywhere between 5 to 21 days from the cocoon stage to the butterfly stage 21 days of liminal space you know where i'm going with this right 21 days between a caterpillar that has grown grown to about 100 times its size and and becoming a beautiful beautiful monarch butterfly now i don't know now i don't know what plans Miss Monarch is making during this time. I don't know if she's wondering if she should go to a private flower for education or a public flower for education. Now I don't know if she's stressing about her glow up, you know, as when she becomes a a, a butterfly. I don't know if she's thinking about her relationship status after becoming a butterfly. I don't know what this Miss Monarch is thinking, but I do know something. She was being transformed. Yeah. She was in the process of becoming a butterfly and she changed. And so my friends, I'm wondering, I'm wondering, just just wondering if this liminal space is a space predominantly for transformation and growth. It's that space where all these things happen in our lives. In church, watch this. In in uh in a few decades from now, if someone were to ask you, "What year did you remember the most?" "What year did you remember the most?" I'm sure there'll be a unanimous vote for one one year. 2020, right? At least it's for me, 2020. But what if 
2020 was not only the year that we remember the most, but 2020 was also the year that we were transformed the most. When we look back, after all of this stuff settles down, no more masks, no more social distancing, whenever that happens, when we look back, can we say 2020 was the year that my priorities changed? 2020 was the year that my direction in life changed. 2020 was the year that my relationships deepened. 2020 was the year that I knew that I was more capable than I thought I was. 2020 was the year that I believed that there was more to life than what meets the eye. The 2020 was the year that I knew that I was more capable than what others thought I was. That 2020 was the year that I believed that there was more to reality than just stuff. That 2020 was the year that profoundly shaped the person that I am today. That 2020 was the year that I knew that I don't just exist for myself. That I am who I am in relationship. That I am loved. That I have worth. I wonder who can say, my friends, that 2020 was the year that I knew that the sufferings that I went through, that the pain that I endured, that the mountains that I climbed, that the valleys that I had to sink into, that the fears that I had to face, and the anxieties that I had to wrestle and struggle with, that all the things that I have went through that other people do not have an idea about, what if we can say that all of those things have transformed me beyond my wildest imaginations? And if so, this space can be, as theologian Richard Rohr says, a sacred space where the old world is able to fall apart and a bigger world is revealed. Let's pray. Ah, Jesus, thank you for this time. Lord, we don't know what to pray for. There is so much hurt. There is so much chaos. There is so much confusion. There is so much distress, unrest. Uh, It's just a lot. There's just a lot going on in our lives. And you know, Lord, you know what we are going through in this moment. Individually, in our own families. Some of us silently battling things that other people have no idea about. Oh God, we are in this liminal space. And so if, if Lord, you're able, and I know you are, to use the space, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would transform us into the people that you want us to be. In the moment, it doesn't look pretty. This is not looking nice, Lord. There's so much things that we need to pray for right now. And I pray, Lord, that your will be done and that you will come through and that you will be king over the flood right now in the lives of our families and our churches. And God, in the process, I pray that you would continue to sensitize our hearts, sensitize our minds to the frequency of your voice so that we'll be able to tune in to your whispers, your voice, wherever that comes from, Lord, and help us to hold on to that. Not in a fatalistic, this is all I need to do, I don't have to worry about everything else kind of way. But choosing and practicing faith and practicing hope and practicing love and placing our future and our past and our present in your hands because you're already there. You're already in the future. You're already there. And if you have beaten death, you have conquered it all. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Can't wait to see you. Can't wait to see us, see you face to face. Ha! It can be great and glorious, glorious day. Man. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.